What's up you guys? Welcome to today's video. So as you can tell by the title, I have a very special guest. I interviewed the infamous jewel thief, Larry Lawton himself. You guys actually recommended his channel to me and within 10 minutes of kind of watching his video and just seeing his overall energy, I was like, yep, I have to have him on. So when you are watching this video, Larry has also posted an interview that I did for his channel. So that can be found in the description box down below. Definitely go check out that interview after this one um, and make sure you go subscribe to Larry. He is just, he's so real. He's so straightforward and so blunt. He is a true New Yorker. The people that have gone through some crazy stuff like Larry has have my respect automatically. But then when you use that horrible trauma and the, those horrible experiences like he went through in prison to help people on the outside, those are my people. You know, that is true strength right there. When you take something as traumatizing as what we're gonna talk about in today's video and you use that to help other people, man, you, you got my respect. Larry also has an autobiography and I'm gonna leave that link down below. Larry, thank you so much for hanging out with me for a little bit. I could talk to you all day. So I really appreciate the time that you took out of your day to, to hang out with us. So be sure to follow Larry on all his social medias and check out his autobiography as well. All right, without further ado, Let's go ahead and get started. Larry Lawton, I am so happy to have you here today. I found you on YouTube like five minutes ago. You blew up on YouTube. And a few of my subscribers were like, do you know who Larry Lawton is? So as soon as I searched your name, I fell down a YouTube rabbit hole. And I'm like, I love this guy. Because you're like, not to say anything about age, but you're like my grandpa or my dad that I would just hang out with and chill with. You know, you remind me a lot. I get that a lot. <laughs> You remind me a lot of my family members, you know, I'm from New York as well, upstate New York. And I just saw your story and I'm like, we got to have him on within 10 minutes of seeing your channel. So welcome to the Jessica Kent show. Well, I'm glad to be here, Jessica. Uh, likewise, obviously, you know, doing joint interviews, so to speak, is great. And, and hearing your story uh, through my son uh, at first, and then I do a little research always. Just not, I mean, he does the deep dive and then I look up and say oh and i love the initial thing so i think it's gonna be great and you gotta like check that. paperwork you know you gotta yeah well, I, did, I, I did a lot of that i did a lot of that when i was away so you're but. a very famous and very successful jewel thief talk to me about why and how and what the heck uh, you know i hate to say it. You, know, I, you can't say famous how about infamous, infamous. Uh, i was a bad guy for a long time uh, i would i robbed between 50 and 18 million in diamonds uh, up and down the East Coast. I was associated with organized crime. Uh, I went away from not telling. I ended up beating a life sentence. I ended up doing four 12-year sentences. I beat a life sentence uh, in a preliminary hearing, a gun charge. I beat the gun charge. Otherwise, I would have got 100 years. So I was never getting out. Uh, I did the law for 10 years. I'm a licensed paralegal. Uh, and, we, you know, that's that helped me a lot. I did my own case in the firing lawyers you know lawyers are sharks we all know that uh so at this point you know you know you say infamous i wrote a book i wrote a book called gangster redemption and the book is widely accepted because it, it, it's a true life story it's 100 percent true about how i became the biggest jewel jewel thief and i'm still recognized to this day as the biggest jewel out in the united states and i do a lot of tv stuff for crime but i'm more known as a prison advocate and uh, criminal justice reform advocate. And, uh, you know, I tell it like it is. I, I don't know. You, I, I'm done with bullshit in my life. I'm at that age, you say, you know, like your dad or whatever you want to call it. Uh, in fact, my son and you are the same age. But it, it's, I don't give a fuck. I, I, I put my pants on the way everybody else does. Uh, I'm a straight shooter. I respect everybody. Uh, there's zero prejudices in me. I mean zero, uh, and and I was in a place where people thought oh, you got to be pressed. No, it, it, that comes from you inherently. I, 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 everybody, we all made choices and we all live with them. And I don't care what your choices and what you did in the past. That's what you do today. And I don't care how you had a surviving press. We all fucking did all bad shit. And it is what it is. You know, who gives a fuck? If you're gonna judge me, I don't want to be around people like that. And uh, I try to help as many people as I can. That's my goal. Uh, I love doing the YouTube, as you say. I, I, my, I started a YouTube uh, in November, so it was 
still nine months, 10 months now, it'll be 10 months, and we blew up. And uh, what happened with the YouTube was it's a way to get your voice out there in a positive way and tell it like it is. And we can get into that later, but that's really so. I don't know about famous and infamous, because I did, but you know, the good part of what I did, I didn't hurt people during those robberies. Uh, Yes, you do hurt. You put a gun in a person's face and you put them on the floor and you tie them up. Trust me, that's trauma. But I didn't shoot somebody in a robbery. I didn't pistol with people. I didn't do any of that. Now, if you read my book and you know, I'm sending you one, if you, if you were in my business, if you were in the crime business or drug business or something, you didn't want to run across me because then I did do bad things to people. I taught you a person I'm not proud of. Uh, you were Rob from us, you were in the gangster business. You don't want to be in the gangster business and run into me those days. Now today, I mean, like, I'm the, I'm the grandfather. I'm the, uh, you know, my kid's popular. I, I just, my life is so different. And that's why I love to interview you because I see young people who are changing the world and everybody wants to give up on young people. Piss me off because fuck, you guys are so smart. You told me what you do on your own YouTube channel with editing. It says, I don't do that shit. I got a 21 year old does that. Um, you know, it, it's amazing. Obviously I could, and you know, we're workers. We are relentless people who've been in behind bars. They, they have a work ethic that's off the charts. And if, I mean, you are a successful drug dealer. I mean, so you could be successful at anything. I was a successful criminal. Be success at something else. So, and you now more impressed me. Young people impress me. People, I've been, I've been in many meetings with government officials and very high level people in reform and stuff. And so I've had somebody tell me once, uh, we should give up on some of these people. Like, what? Look at me. I got out of prison, Jessica, at 47 years old, or 46, turning 47. Got out of prison. Think about that. Nothing, sixty-seven thousand dollars in debt, out of prison. Go from a millionaire to nothing, and I could change. And now you probably know my age. I'll be fifty-nine here soon, and I don't feel it. I mean, I have my own. Every my age has health issues of some sort. But my point is, is you could you could change. I mean, people change. So whatever age they were, whatever they did wrong in life. You can get out of prison at any age and be a success. You could also be a failure if you want to let yourself be a failure. And I refused that. And in anything I did, I refused that. And, and that's why I believe, you know, I don't, we all need help. Don't get me wrong. Everybody needs help some way or the other. And that help can come in the form of a mentor, come in the form of a friend or family or, or yourself or a stranger that just at that one time in a day helps you gave you something, an apartment for rent, something, somebody did something for you to open your eyes and say, wow, I needed, I needed that. Or things could have just fucking went the wrong way real quick. Because you know, people like you and I know how to survive in the wrong way. Yeah, it, That's you know, easy. It's, it's difficult to change that mindset and to get out of like the criminal life and the criminal mentality, especially because, you know, certain certain crimes when you're very good at it it's so easy to do that it's so much easier to do that than grind it out the hard way so just to back up a little bit you stole diamonds out of jewelry stores how did you do that how did you manage to steal millions of dollars of diamonds well i i robbed over 20 jewelry stores over 20 and i robbed them up and down the east coast of the united states and they were wholesalers and i would go in and literally throw everyone down, guns, tie them up, up, wipe out the whole store. So it could be a million dollars in diamonds in that store and they're wiped out. Uh, and I ended up uh, having a fence in New York. I forget who he is, what can I say? Uh, so nobody went to prison on my case. Uh, and when I got, I got rid of my diamonds, when I robbed a jewelry store, they were out of my hands in 24 hours, literally. And I would get a bag of cash of, Hundreds of thousands of dollars is a bag, 250, 300, 400,000 is a bag of cash. And you just, you know, 
Okay, next robbery. And I was doing two, I, I was running from 1988, 89 to 96 when I got caught. I had a hell of a run. Millions and millions of dollars. Casinos lost, partying, women, drugs. I used to do lines of coke, eight foot long, and strip clubs, and had bought girls tits. I did everything you can think of as the wild man. Of hey, boobs times. are expensive, so I'm sure they appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, back then, back then they were five grand. And I don't know what they are today, but the uh, eight grand. <laughs> but I did so much. It, it, I mean, I was just, even then, to this day, I've never in my life ever hit a woman. Never. Uh, I, there's certain beliefs I have. I, I don't pick on old people or kids. Never did. I will defend them. Because I, I, you want to be a bully, bully me. Let's see how far you fucking get. You know? Let Fight somebody who can fight back. Don't fucking think you're a badass because you smack a woman around or you fucking do something. Try to smack me around. I lost my two wives. Not their fault. But my fault. The lifestyle. My first wife, I was in the gangster business and, and it was too much. And I had my son with her to this day. Great friends, good woman, really love her, nice. She's married, great guy too, everything. My son works with me, great guy, I love him. And my daughter was with my second wife. And she was the, at that time, the 20 year old, I was the 32 year old. She was a hot stripper kind of, you know, I was just, you know, she was just a nice girl. And to this day, She's great. She's in her forties. Actually, I'm fifty nine, which is twelve years difference. So she's born in seventy three. So she just turned about forty seven. And uh, we're friends. It's just the mother of my daughter, and she's twenty five. My daughter. So can you talk to me a little bit about the prison politics? You mentioned that you respect, you know, children and women. Can you talk about what that looks like in prison? What happens when mm -hmm. people with bad charges come through? Yeah, I love the word bad charges. Uh, there's certain charges, obviously, you know, uh, in prison, chomo, child molester. Now, well, in, in the system, there's what we call, first of all, bad and good charges. If, you, if you're a snitch, no good at it. If you're a robber or a drug dealer, you know, you're respected in your own way. If you're a chomo or a child, or even someone beat on a grandmother or old lady, you're not going to be uh, respected too much. Now, a, a guy like myself used to be able to pull paperwork, they call it. So meaning that is when you go to prison, they don't let you have your paperwork because they don't want people to see their paperwork or what they are because they need to protect these people in prison. Well, I used to get the paperwork, used to get the doctor sheets and everything else. I was doing law. I had a friend of mine who was an attorney on the street and I would just say, I need the doctor sheet because I'm doing law work. And if you know anything about legal work, I can read a doctor sheet. And in the docket sheet has like the charges and what filings and the pleas and, and, and also it'll have FBI what they call 302s. They're the information when someone wants to snitch, stuff like that. And they said, well, like a child molester in prison, they are not treated well. We used to, I used to see them beaten, thrown off tears, stabbed. I mean, literally pounded to, to death. I mean, uh, seen a guy get a buffer machine dropped on his head for rat and that's some crazy shit. I mean, from another tier, a heavy buffer machine. I watched that his whole head crushed into it. But anyway, uh, how it works is I would get the paper, a gang person, whether they call them shot callers, like it could be the, the Norteño, Sedanias, Aztec, as the MAs, or, you know, Gangsta Disciples, Bloods, Crips, GDs, or even, you know, Hispanic gangs, Latin King, Nietzsche, G27, whatever they are. So they were in prison, and I, they used to come to me and say, that, you know, we, we need this paperwork, do us a favor. They give me the guy's info. Now, how I teach people is don't think you can get a lot of round shit, because this is how it works. If you go to prison, and let's just say you're 20 years old, and you're 20 years old and a cop stops you and he catches you with three joints in the ashtray and he, use, and he says, listen to me, I'm not going to arrest you. I'm not going to do anything. I just want to know what you got. And you say, no, no, no. He goes, listen, I'm taking you in. He goes, he goes listen, I'm not going to arrest you. I'm not going to do anything. I just want to know what you got. So you're a kid and you're 20 and say, okay, I got him from Jessica. Now, they go, they don't arrest Jessica. They never arrest him. You think you're fine. But what you don't know is the police have to take that information, they give it to their drug unit. The drug unit doesn't realize, hey, it's not a big enough case, but they put it in there. 
you know, William Smith told us Jessica uh, King did this or whatever it is, Jessica McCann, you know, whatever you did. And they never arrested you, but that's it. Now that's in the file. After five years, that's public information. Now, William Smith comes to prison to where I'm at. He thinks he's a tough, he doesn't remember that he did that. And he says, I ain't fucking shit. You know, I never lied, never went to jail. He thinks he's all right. All of a sudden, his gang leader says, hey, lad, check him out. What does Larry do? Larry finds out where he lives because I give him the information. I run his shit. And then I take every police department in that area and I get their Freedom of Information Act on that name. By law, they have to give it to me. Now, that kid, I know that that kid told that Jessica Kent fucking sold him this shit or whatever. And he told Nothing happened, but I know he told. I just give this to the gang leader, and that kid's fucked. Didn't even know it. Another thing they have is child molesters. Child molesters. As a child molester, if you came to prison, Jessica comes to prison, and, and Jessica has, is 18 or 19 and has sex with a 17-year-old, we don't give a fuck. It's a charge. We don't give a fuck. That's a pass. We don't give a shit. But there's a code in the federal regulations I forget the exact number, but if you had sex and you're 20, 21, 22, whatever it is, and you had sex with an under 12 year old, I'm gonna know about it. And then you're fucked. You're gonna get done. And if it gets deeper and I wanna read into your case more, which I've seen some horrific shit, as you probably well know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen people abuse two year olds and shit and fucking stuff that fucking they were done. I watched the guy get thrown off the fucking tier, landed on his neck and died. And, I, and to be honest, I hate to say this, and I, I, I try to get myself right. It's hard for me to feel bad, even though that dies and everything. I don't know the whole stories. But anytime you mess with a fucking kid, it's a no-no in prison. And snitching, those beating up an old lady. But, I mean, drug dealers, armed robbers, fucking hijackers, fucking counterfeiters, all the shit. And I was a maximum security prison. I made a medium once that they want for me to get back. You know, I went, I started in a max and then went back to the max. But it was just the way my mentality was. First of all, it's a survival mentality, as you know. And when you do a long time, when you're over a decade, and I had four twelves, and people go, "What do you mean four twelves? I go, "You ever hear them say that guy's got three life sentences?" And they go, "Yeah." I go, what do you? You can't die three times. I said, "What it means is, if I beat one case legally." I still got to do the life. That's what that means. They give you three life sentences. So legally, if you win one on appeal, guess what? You're still doing life. I had four 12s. I had four different 12s. And they ran them concurrent, not consecutive. That's called running wild in the system. And if you run them wild, that's 48 years. But they ran mine consecutive. So as I'm doing one, it's doing the other. But if I beat one on an appeal, I'm still fucking doing that 12. So it's not like you can get away from that. But that's how, how the system works with guys like myself. Or, and I was a, I hate to say it, I was a professional criminal. I mean, I, I, didn't, I wasn't an addict when this, as an addict. Uh, I wasn't, I was power hungry. I was totally power hungry and I had a lot of power. I had mayors that I bought. I had people that I bribed. I had, you know, cities and shit that I did that was fucking off the charts. And my book has a lot of it, Gangster to Redemption. You can add, people can actually listen to my book on YouTube. I'm the first YouTuber to do that, to actually take their book and summarize every chapter in a series. And it's one of the most watched series now on YouTube. I cannot wait to read your, I'm old school, I like to read the book. So I can't wait yeah. to read You're your You're a prisoner book. too. You read a lot, I'm sure. I did. Yeah. Um, so at what point were you like, I'm done with that. I don't want to be that person anymore. I want to fight for prison reform. I want to help other people. When was that change made? The true change is what I knew what I want to do when I get out. When a friend of mine died in prison, he killed himself. He told me he was going to do it. Uh, we were in the hole. And, you know, when you're in the hole, which is called at segregation, shoe, special housing unit, different name, but it's called the hole. When I was in the hole, uh, uh, you can literally talk to the guy in the next cell through the vent right next to you. So I used to do what they call burpees and work out. I got pictures. I'll send you a car. I mean, I was fucking beat up. I mean, I, I looked like holy shit. 
I mean, I got pictures of me when I got out. I look now I'm a fat fuck. But anyway, uh, when I when I was in prison. And I used to work out and do crazy burpees. I used to do 600 push-ups and 600 crunches in 45 minutes. I mean, just just six. You know, I mean, you do burpees, doing all the crazy exercises. And I'm in the in the hole with my buddy, and his name's Jack. He's in the cell next to me, and he goes, "Hey, buddy, I love you, but I'm checking out." The fuck you go. We're in the hole. Boom. The light bulb goes off. I jump up on the steel toilet. You know what they are, the steel toilets. And I jump up in the vents right up there. And I said, man, Jack, lay down. This is right before count, three about 3.30. Every day in the Federal Bureau of Prisons at 4 p.m. is count time. Every day. I mean, every fucking person has to be standing on their feet. Because one time they counted someone three days. He was dead in his bed. Every single inmate is standing on his feet no matter where they are in prison. At four o'clock. In fact, it's two eleven. We're doing this interview, and I can tell you right now, at uh, it's amazing because at four o'clock, at, uh, if I look at my watch and do something, it just it, it suddenly hits me. And that's and I've been out 12, 12 13 years. It was all this. So anyway, anyway uh, he says, I go lay down, man, lay down, Jack. We'll talk about it after count. Well. He, I lay down, lay on my butt, and they go by to scream, cap time, cap time. You gotta get on your feet, stand on your feet. When they go by, you go lay down. So they go by my cell, and they stop at his cell, and they kick the door, and they scream at the, they hit the button on the radio. It's a little orange button, and they call it the deuces. But you know why they call that the deuces? It's because every single uh, phone in the prison, if you hit two, 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 they all come running. That's like the alarm. And they hit the deuces, and they said, man down, man down. Well, they came, they took Jack out, blanket over him. And they, the reason we know he died is they recount. That means he has to go outside. When they recount the prison, that means somebody had to leave the prison. When there's a national count, that's a national count that literally goes to Washington, D.C. They have to recount. So they, he ends up dying, and it... it I laid in my bed, and I'm not kidding you, Jessica. That's the one time in my life I was crying, and I'm not very religious per se. I'm spiritual more than anything. And I laid in my bones. I said, man, God, why not me? And it dawned on me. That's when I was going to say, I'm going to do something. And I saw too many fucking kids come to prison. Now I'm not, and I got to remember, at this time I'm about 40, maybe 40. And I'm like, what the fuck? Maybe a little younger at 38, 30, and these fucking kids come to prison. I'm talking to 22, 23. They think they're badasses. They come in there, they're fucking not. And I'm fucking one of them. They're all predators. We're predators. Now, it doesn't mean I preyed on somebody, but I was a predator. I was a fucking alpha. And most of these kids, I don't give a fuck how big and tough they think they are. They're prey. There's only predators and prey in prison. And you, you know, you're a New Yorker, you're a predator in your own way. It doesn't mean you preyed on somebody. But your attitude, your way you handle yourself, you're a predator. Doesn't mean you prey on people, but there are only two people. And and the violence you see, and, and, and I know women's prisons, as you know, I was I was in a, a Tallahassee, and the guards just did that a woman's side. He goes, man, these fucking women are fucking crazy. They're, they're fucking nuts, and how they make this shit. I was in a half an hour when women had these Tallahassee to make their dildos and fucking straps and shit. And, and they take the fucking, uh, the, you know, like the men use the gloves. The women, they take the pants, they double them over, and they turn them, and they put masking tape, and they put uh, ace bandages for straps. And they, they told me, I, I was great. And women are crazy too. They're fucking knives and shit, you know. There's no difference. I mean, you get women with life sentences. You know, they get a life sentence. And I guess I don't judge anybody who does anything. Person, shit. I did a lot of crazy shit. I stabbed two people. I've been stabbed, shot. I've been shot. I mean, so I lived a crazy life. But uh, it is what it is. And I'm not. You know, people ask me all the time, "Do you regret things?" I don't regret a thing. Would I do things different? Obviously, we all would. You wouldn't lose your child. I would lose my kids. I had a 15 month old baby when I went to prison. I get out, she was 13. My son, who you talked to, I was at eight. I went to prison when he was six. I got out, he was 18. So, so fucking, what was that like getting out? You have to get to know them all over again. Yeah, well, my daughter used to visit. My, my ex, first ex wife, you'll understand this, 
didn't want to bring my son to get that environment. You know, they come from Brooklyn, Benson Earth, gangsters. And my son was a fucking, he's like a gangster. He's tatted like me. How do I say anything about that? He was fucking body. But, and, uh, but he, you got a few. So, but he, he's, he, he grew up a tough kid. He grew up a tough kid in the streets. And his dad had a great reputation. You know, I had that reputation of, you know, gangster, didn't run at, stand up. But he went through his tough times too, my son. And he's doing great today. He's a father. And again, children change people's lives. And my, son, my grandson, my grandson is four and my granddaughter's two. So he's changed a lot. And, and, but I had to get to know him. But he, you know, when he was younger, I got it why his ex, my ex-wife didn't want him to come to the prison system and do that shit. Now my second wife did bring my daughter all the time. So she, but my, my daughter didn't know who I was. She only thought for the first five years of my life, her life, six, seven years, almost even more, they told her he was away. He just was working and they would visit me. And they didn't tell her until one of her cousins said, oh, your dad's in jail. Your dad's a big gangster. And then she ended up not understanding. And by the time I got out, yeah, and those visits, you go to visit the prison and the kid come and they, they got to leave. And, fucking they're so stressful and uh you know then the prison system transferred me all around because i wasn't the model in me i fought the system i got my legal paralegal degree and i fought the system i literally fought them every step away sued them sued the attorney general and you're gonna laugh at this one your audience i sued them and this is in the legal record i was caught jacking off in my own cell like who fucking doesn't jack off in my own cell? i mean i'm a man I even had a doctor write that it's healthy for a man to masturbate after 40. And I was thrown in a hole for 40 days for fucking jerking off in my own cell to myself. And I go, are you kidding me? And just I to give, Just to give the audience some <laughs> uh, explanation here. They don't oh. allow that in prison, you know, so that is a disciplinary and it makes no sense because we're human beings. So they don't allow you to do that. <laughs> It, 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 you know, it used to drive me crazy. Every, how can you tell a man he can't do Or a woman. I don't give a shit who you are. And, uh, but my point was, I fought them every step of the way. I sued them. I fought them physically first. And I couldn't win physically. I've been concussion grenaded. I've been maced. I've been shocked. I was in the hole for three years. 11 straight months in the hole. Three years in the hole out of my time. And I was one of those very combative. I mean, I'm nuts. Don't think I didn't think of suicide. It's all the crazy shit. And I survived it. And my friend, see, my friend died. Uh, but not only him, I've seen a bunch of friends die. It's when I started learning the law that I really started, they really didn't like me. They tried to kill me. I was strapped down naked, beaten and tortured for 11 straight months, literally. Strapped down the cold four pointed like this. Strap. A guard took his dick out and peed on my face. That's all documented. I mean, I was in the prison system. I was in the fucking hole. And I did it because they killed a friend of mine named Jim March. And he, he was having medical problems. And his own boss at the CMS in prison told him, hey, get the medical. And he, he's been complaining he had arms. He's 46 years old. Jim March. He was in. Indian guy, great guy. He used to play horseshoes on the yards. And he's having a chest pain. It goes to medical. Medical's 100 yards from our unit. They tell him, get out of here, you got Maalox. They gave him Maalox, he said, you got gas. He comes back into the unit. He grabs a friend of mine named Jimmy Brown. We're standing right there. And we're both looking at TV. He walks in the unit. He goes, Jimmy, I'm dying. Mm-hmm. We both. Jimmy and I would put him in a chair. He falls over. Now, if you ever saw a person die, they uh, relieve themselves. You know, whatever's in the system, that, that's when you expire. So the guards scream, lock down, lock down. Everybody's locked him down, lock down. And they locked down. And we tried to help him, but they wouldn't let him. Then they brought him, they put him on a, on a, a golf cart stretch after outside, right out my window. You know, the little thin windows they have in prison right out the window and they're laughing. And they came around to every unit, you know, every uh, 
tell because we're at cells. We're no dorms, shave at cells. And he says, I'm at Skirt Prison. He says, Oh, you showing me this head? I said, Fuck you. You killed that motherfucker. She stabbed somebody. What did they do to me? Yank me out, throw me in the hole. 11 straight months to try to shut me up. And they strapped me, literally. I used to hear them come down the tier. And as you know, the noise of keys and, and doors and radios. Well, you'd hear them open the end door. And the most anxious I've ever got in my life was when they opened that tier door. And they went all the way down to the end of the tier, where I was, or cell. And they didn't say cuff up. Because if you're in the hole, they'll tell you, cuff up. Mm-hmm. And you got to put your hands behind your back and cuff up. And they open the slot door and they cuff you up. Didn't have to do that. They opened the door and fucking beat me half to death. And then dragged me out, stripped me naked. You know, I'm naked. And one guard spit on me and took his dick out. I could feel it today. A peeing on my face and saying, keep writing senators, Lord. Keep writing senators. Because I was writing senators. I was fighting the system. The system's so broke, Jessica. I want your audience to know that. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here at one minute saying I was innocent because I wasn't. I'm not even saying there aren't people who belong in prison. There are some people in prison. I don't want them out next to you, next to my mom, next to me, my family, because they're psychopaths. We know that. But not everybody. There are people who have addicts or they're drugs like yourself who just made bad choices. Or there were people who were trying to change. There were regular people, young people. That not everybody's bad. And 95% of what people get now. So what are we doing? We're only making hard new criminals by fucking doing what we're doing to people. But, you know, my goal now is to put a spotlight on, on the system, help make change where we can, and let people know that, you know, there's laws that came out for so long, they still are. You know, when a dude gets out of prison, he can't even rent an apartment because he's a felon. Uh, it happened to me. I had a, I was charged three times the deposit because I was a felon. And here I was doing well. This is four years after I was out, four or five years. And I'm doing well. I had a company with helping people called the Reality Check Program. And what did they do? They fucking tell they won't rent me a place, a beautiful place in Fort Lauderdale. Three times they charged me because I had a family. Well, first of all, just to back up a little bit, you're so brave. You're such a badass for wanting to fight from prison. Yeah. That is so That's hard. what kept me alive. I don't consider myself brave or strong or anybody. I, I think it kept me going instead of giving up to the I system. Mean, it you kept don't. Me fighting. You don't tell the correction officers you just killed somebody. That saying that, they will they'll try to kill you because now you know. You know what I mean? The the things that go on there would blow your mind. They're disgusting oh. things. And to know that you fought every step of the way and that's what kept you going. I'm just I am in, I am so inspired by your strength. I can't even imagine going through what you went through. I was always a short timer. You know, and yeah, I've been to the max, but like this is a whole different ball game. So if you guys don't know Larry's story, please watch him on YouTube. This is a fraction of his story that we're seeing here. Um, so just to wrap up, cause we've been filming for two hours. I don't want to keep him much longer. <laughs> um, but what are you doing today? And what would you tell somebody that's in that lifestyle that is just desperate for change, but they don't know how to do it because all they've known is, is the street life. What would you say to them? You know, people change. I, I want everybody to know people change. Uh, nobody's the same person. I tell people when you're 20, you know it all. When you hit 30, you look back and say, what I needed that I was at 20. Well, when you hit 40, you're going to look back and say, man, I didn't know shit at 30. Well, when you hit 50, you're going to look back and say, man, fucking 40, I didn't know anything. Well, I'm 50, I'll be 59. I still keep saying I don't know anything. And I want people to know, don't judge people. I mean, that's my big thing, uh, no matter what. And I also want your audience to know they might not have heard your whole story. I did a very compelling interview with Jessica, and it's on my station. It was a long interview, but it was something that everybody needs to hear about her. Now, you watch her on her channel. I don't think she's ever got that deep into her her life. I don't know. 
that she's did on my channel because we got into it very deep about the birth of a child and everything else in prison. So I think everybody on your channel needs to go and hear your story because your story is amazing too. And it gives me inspiration and YouTube does. YouTube, you know, I think it gives us the platform to help others. And I want to see you keep growing. I think you're doing great. Uh, and you got the little babies and the family. And, and I hope, I hope you stay in touch for a long time. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And I'm so inspired by you. All that positivity that you just gave me, I give it right back to you. I can't wait to read your book. I'm going to leave all of Larry's information as well as that book. Y'all need to get it linked in the description box down below. Thanks again for spending uh, a little bit of time with me and I'll see you later. Thanks, Jess. Have a great day. God bless.